Hello. You saw last year that I brought you Hot to the Top Bunny's Revenge, and all of the levels were procedurally generated, but what if you didn't want them to be? Earlier this year, I made a game called Bunny's Boing Ball Bounty, and this one actually had defined levels that were saved to disk. So, in this video, we're going to have a quick look at building our own simple level designer from scratch. So the technique I'm going to show you today is based around tiles. But before we get into that, let's talk about levels, and I'm going to start talking about how they're actually constructed in a lot of games. Take this for example. This is from the absolutely terrible Captain Planet game that was bundled with so many Amigas. And if you look carefully, a lot of the graphics is repeated over and over. Now they could have drawn this as one huge image inside a paint program and loaded a massive picture in, but that would use a lot of memory and disk space. So instead, they split the background up into tiles, quite often 16 pixels wide by 16 pixels high. This was such a common approach that platforms like the Mega Drive actually supported tiles like this directly within its graphics hardware in the VDP, or Video Display Processor. And that split the screen into 32 or 40 columns wide by 28 or 30 rows. The Amiga doesn't have that fixed tile restriction, which is both a bonus and a curse. It's great because it allows us to have much more flexibility, but the curse is it means much more work for the developer and the graphics hardware. So instead of storing an entire picture for the level, you just need to store some information as to which tile should be drawn for every 16 pixel box, or whatever size you decide to use. And that becomes really handy for the gameplay too, as you can more easily discover what's behind your main character sprite. So let's assume we want to build a simple platform game. First, we need a tile set, so I've borrowed this one from Open Game Art, and you can see in the preview images the sort of things you're able to create. Now if we look at the tile set that comes with this package, it actually looks like this. And to make it a little bit easier to understand, here it is again, but I've put some lines around the tiles so you can see how they're split up. I'm going to rearrange and remove some of the extra gems and potions, because then the graphics use only 32 colours, and that's perfect for us. So I want to build a really simple level designer for this tile set. Now, there are several extensions that can do this in Amos from back in the day, and Tome was one of the big ones, but it also wasn't free. Now, I'm more interested in creating my own, because aside from the fact that it allows us to customise it to what we need, it's also very good learning for how it works. And we'll make sure we keep the user interface very simple. Now, the first step to get those tiles is to get those tiles actually into Amos. Amos has a few different ways to store graphics, and you could just store them as a compressed IFF picture. You could capture them as bobs or sprites, or you can capture them as icons. And icons are the perfect choice for this, partly because they default not to transparent, so they draw much faster. Now we could grab these one by one using the Amos object editor, but that's a little tedious when we already know their sizes and positions. So instead, I've written a tiny, tiny Amos program to grab them straight into an icon bank and save them to disk. Because there are spaces in the tile map, we're going to end up with some black empty squares, a total of 19, out of the 80 we've captured. I'm not going to worry about this, in reality you'd put some other tiles in there, erase them, or not capture them in the first place. Now at this point, we've got two choices. We could either create a level editor that creates layouts for a single screen, or we could create one that creates much larger screens that might be scrolled around. For simplicity, we'll stick with a simple single screen size, although the concept is very much the same. So I'm going to assume that the levels we edit will be 20 tiles wide by 11 tiles high. This leaves a little bit of space on an NTSC system for the game's heads-up display. But just in case we change our minds, we'll define this at the start of our program. This gives us a grid containing 220 tiles, and there's a few ways we could keep that information in memory. We could define a two-dimensional array to hold this, kind of like a table in a spreadsheet. And there's nothing wrong with doing this, but I want to be able to instantly read and write this to disk in a nice compact form. So instead, I'm going to use an Amos memory bank, number 10, and I'll reserve it to contain one byte for each tile in the level. And if there's fast memory available, Amos will automatically try and use that first. So to make an editor, the easiest way is to have a screen show the map we're designing and a separate screen for the controls. So I'm loading in the tile set we captured before, opening two different screens, and clearing them to two different colours so you can see where they are. Now down here you'll notice a wait VBL command. This will force Amos to actually update everything, meaning the value we get from Y hard will be correct. Y hard returns the position of a screen coordinate in physical space, i.e. which line on the monitor it appears at, and this allows us to push the control panel below the level display. Now onto the user interface, we need to be able to load and save levels as well as clear them. We need to be able to place single tiles down and remove single tiles, as well as actually selecting which tile we want to place. 
So, I'm going to create a simple procedure that will create our buttons. Nothing fancy, and I'm going to use the AMOS zones to help us detect when the mouse is over them. So I've created this button procedure that simply writes some text in a box, and assigns an AMOS zone to it. I've defined five buttons. One for load, save, clear, and moving the selection around. And then I've drawn 12 boxes for the icons to show in. The arrows will allow you to scroll through the other tiles that are available. And after doing this and running it, you see a screen looking like this. Now on to making this work, we'll start with the tile selection. I've removed the box command from the initial loop, and I've added a procedure called refresh tiles. This will redraw all of the boxes every time called, pasting the icons from the icon bank inside. If it finds the selected icon, it stores its position so we can draw a box around it in a different colour. Now let's handle some mouse input and start to make things happen. Before looping and monitoring for the mouse, I've stored the hardware position of the top of the screen. Then, in the main loop, we monitor the state of the mouse button, and if any of them are pressed, we check to see if the mouse is within the map level screen. If it is, we'll call our tile place procedure that I've just created, and pass in the screen coordinates of the mouse cursor, along with which button was pressed. If not, we'll switch to the bottom of the screen and see which zone is under the mouse, and depending on which one, we call an appropriate procedure. Now, I haven't written any of these yet, so let's start with the tile selection. The first procedure, tile scroll, handles moving the currently visible list of tiles around so we can get to all of them. And the second procedure, tile selected, looks almost the same, only this time for selecting one of the tiles. Both of them call the refresh tiles procedure we looked at a minute ago, so that the current selection and choices are reflected. So let's have a look at that working. And it works just like I described, I can scroll the list of tiles back and forward nicely, but also I can select one of them. Next up, we want to be able to draw the selected tile, and that's really, really easy. All we do is add some code into our tile place procedure that we created earlier. We divide the mouse position by 16 and then multiply it back up to 16 to draw it in its position. If the left mouse button is down, we're going to draw the currently selected icon, but if the right mouse button is down, we're going to clear the space and remove the icon. And with that in place, it looks like this, and it's really, really easy to use. But there's a problem with this, it's not storing anything. So we need to update our tile place procedure to actually write this to memory, and it's very, very easy. I've added two poke commands that will write into the memory location in bank 10 that we reserved earlier, which makes it really, really easy now to load and save it. So let's create our load and save procedures. And as you can see, they're really simple. But there's another problem here with the load procedure. Once loaded, it won't redraw. So we need to add some code here to redraw the level to the screen. So I'll create a new procedure called Level Draw, and the best thing about this procedure is we can probably end up using it in the game directly too. It's also very simple, and it works its way through the memory bank and pastes the tiles to the screen. And here it is in action. First I'll create something, then I'll save it, then I'm going to change it a little bit, and finally we'll load it back in again. Perfect. That just leaves adding the clear procedure, and this one's even simpler, we just clear the screen and set all of the memory bank to zero. So that's a basic level editor, but there's a few things you could do to improve it and speed it up. How about this? I've added some extra code to automatically work through the tile sets for speed, which kind of gives this result. It's not bad, but there's even more you can do, which leads to this kind of speed optimization. Now that's very cool. Now there's an absolute ton of other things you could do that would be specific to the game you're making. There might be other bits of metadata you need to store, such as level name, or the player's starting position, or a specific tile might be linked to another one, for example a lever tile might be linked to a specific door tile. But it's clear that building a game like this with a map is much easier than drawing a picture. From the game side, if the player sprite is over the top of a tile containing your key, then you can easily detect that and take the appropriate action. Alternatively, it's easy to just detect if there's a platform below the player and fall down or not. Now, as to actually making the game using these maps, well, I've shown examples of this a few times, including games that scroll. One example is my Hop to the Top game, and whilst levels are auto-generated, it still works in the same way. At the end of October, I'll be releasing the source code for Hop to the Top Bunny's Revenge on my itch.io page, so make sure you follow that page so you don't miss it. 
Coincidentally, that game is also being used as one of the games to play in the Ami West Games competition, so get practicing. I hope you found the concepts in this video interesting. If you did, give the video a thumbs up and subscribe and all that YouTube stuff. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.